Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today's message, in addition to trying to help us understand these quotes that one that Jesus makes, strike the sheep, the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and what John quotes, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, is also highlighting the importance of good leadership. Uh, Nations, teams, churches, cities, schools, they all require leaders. We need leaders to hold us accountable. I mean, I imagine that most employees and students won't work if they can goof off or sleep in without any consequences. Most people won't work or won't work as hard as they would, at least, without some follow-through. Um, we all, and throughout our life, we look for models and examples of how to live. We look at all kinds of different people, but of course, this Lent, we remember that we look first and foremost to our Savior to lead us. Um, God's people certainly do require leadership. Otherwise, we wander or stray, which is part of what that quote, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, part of what it's getting at. In fact, though God had become um, Israel's shepherd, but the latter half of Zechariah, which we're, our reading is from, recounts how they had also rejected Yahweh as their shepherd. As a consequence for that, Zechariah is partly and maybe primarily to the people who heard it originally, looking backwards at what happened in the exile. And that's why Israel had been exiled, because they had abandoned their good shepherd. The people of Jerusalem, also in Zechariah's day, needed encouragement not to give up, but to keep building and continuing to hold on to their faith in Yahweh. And so, Zechariah describes to them what it looks like when they don't follow Yahweh. Uh, it's not good. Yet in Zechariah chapters 12, even though Israel is in trouble and they had been exiled and now brought back, Yahweh nevertheless makes great promises to the pipsqueak city at this point of Jerusalem. Remember, a, a small number of exiles had returned to Jerusalem from Babylon for um, after being corrected by the exile. And now they were trying to tidy up the city, remake their lives there. They had rebuilt the walls, but the temple was not completed, and the city was still, frankly, a, a, a mess. The, it's certainly not the, the once proud city and seat of the Ark of the Covenant that it had been prior to that. Now Jerusalem is just a run-down city with a lot of abandoned buildings and a pawn on the international stage. But Zechariah makes this great promise to, first and foremost, these inhabitants of Jerusalem who don't feel very good about themselves or their city. Yahweh says, the days are coming when Jerusalem will be on fire in a good way. He calls them a flaming pot among the nations, burning up all those around them, but they themselves still going. Yahweh announces that Jerusalem will play a pivotal and central role once again on the worldwide stage. And all those nations who oppose, persecute, and attack them would be overthrown. Jerusalem and her inhabitants will go from being bit players in the act to being the main act. And chapter 12, verse 8 says it this way, Even the weakest of them will be like the hero, King David. And the house of David? Well, the house of David will be like God, like the messenger of the Lord going before them. And shifting over to the New Testament, this is why Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem in the last quarter of Matthew's gospel. Well, in, I think uh, all, at least three of the four gospels, I can't remember if John, but in all those gospels, the text tells us he sets his face towards Jerusalem. And that's because Jesus' plans coincide with his father's, and they included making Jerusalem front and center as part of God's plan of salvation. Jesus wanted every last person in Jerusalem to be exalted. He wanted all to hear the good news of God's plan of salvation, as was his plan to restore the lost sheep of Israel. 
And that's why Jesus entered Jerusalem, or one reason why he entered Jerusalem, even though his fiercest opponents ruled there. Well, Zechariah's words about Jerusalem restored and being made the centerpiece in God's plan also revolved around forgiveness and repentance. It was part of, it's part of the wool, and, well, I can't think of that phrase, woof and wool or something like that, so you probably know what I'm talking about. It's part of the whole wrapped up in Zechariah chapter 12 and 13. Chapter 13 starts out saying, on that day, in other words, on the day Jerusalem being front and center in God's plan of salvation, on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day, I will banish the names of the idols from the land and they will be remembered no more, declares Yahweh Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. I wish I had five or ten extra minutes to talk about what all those verses mean and how they connect to the passion, the fountain flowing from Jesus' side, but we'll have to save that for another time. But the main point is that this certainly, the picture Zechariah paints, if we can track with it, which may be a challenge, um, that picture certainly tracks with Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. He's been, after all, all about repentance. He's been forgiving sins. He's been calling people back to true devotion to Yahweh, and his plan is to restore Jerusalem and God's people, all the same sorts of things Zechariah is talking about. But then we have the twist. You see, the problem is not really that God's ever been unwilling to rescue his people. In fact, he's done it time and time again. He has rescued them from all kinds of tight spots. But the problem is, is that Israel has been straying from Yahweh. And more than that, the problem's not just their sins and iniquities. It's that they won't turn towards Yahweh. Their hearts and minds continue to be oriented in the wrong, towards the wrong sorts of things. Power, money, and pride, and that no matter how many times God turns them, their hearts and minds keep seeming to be reorienting themselves back to those things instead of towards the promises of God. God would be willing to heal and to forgive, but the people are not willing to turn and repent. And this problem has been going on ad nauseum throughout the Old Testament. So what in the world is Yahweh going to do about it? Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9, utters what at first seems like a very cryptic poem. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Uh, this is God describing the past. Again, I think if you read those verses again, and if you had time to read the passion verses, you'd see a lot of similarities um, between what's said here. But the man... To sum some of it up, the man whom Yahweh had loved in the Old Testament was David, right? I mean, that makes sense if you think about it. The man after God's own heart, who writes the Psalms, whom, um, to whom God had made so many promises. This was the man whom God had loved. It was David who had originally captured Jerusalem and made it great, after all. David's line would forever rule from Jerusalem. Jerusalem and David go together, um, and there had been an eternal promise given to David as well. And that's got to be back to Zechariah's day. That's got to be what's in the back of people's minds when they're looking at Jerusalem and wondering why it had been brought so low. And if this was God's plan of restoration, something certainly seemed to be missing. Had not God made David's city great? Where was the renowned line of David? I mean, last week we talked a little about, about Zerubbabel, but Zerubbabel was hardly fulfilling the promises made to David. Well, in this poem, Yahweh is explaining what has happened. And he says it by saying he has turned his sword against the man he loved and the house he loved, David, his shepherd of Israel. Um, that's, and because that's what happens to the exiled house, to the house of David, is uh, no longer has someone ruling in the line, is the long and short of, of what I'm saying there. Um, 
And now we shift back to the disciples and to Jesus. That's exactly what the disciples must have been thinking when they're wondering as Jesus goes willingly to be arrested and he tells them to put away their swords and he does not fight back, but he is crucified. What is going on? They must be wondering. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, Jesus had said. Well, and Zechariah said it first. In the, when Zechariah said it, in the Babylonian exile, Yahweh had turned his sword against the house of David, punishing the descendants of David who sat upon Jerusalem's throne. In, Ze in fact, Zechariah used the exact same language as Ezekiel when Ezekiel predicted the exile, saying that a third would be struck by a sword, a third burned, and yet one third remained and saved a remnant. Well, why had God done this to the Jews in 586 B.C.? Well, he had struck his own people and disbanded them, striking their shepherd, the kings of Jerusalem. He struck them so that they might repent. He did this so that they would return when, when all was taken away from them and would say, once more, Yahweh is our God. And Yahweh would be able to say, they are my people. The land had mourned, just as Zechariah is saying. The psalmist gave words to, these, to this repentance, saying in Psalm 137, May my right hand be crippled, essentially, if it forgets you, Jerusalem. Shut my mouth, Lord, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Well, God's people, remember this was the problem, the Old Testament problem that Zechariah is referring to about the wrong orientation. God's people cannot return to him if they forget him, or if they refuse to come towards him. And the poem in chapter 13 reiterates the same sort of point that is made in chapter 12. They will look on the one they have pierced and mourned. They will see, Yahweh says, they will see that they have wounded me. He's talking about the exile. My people had not just forgotten me, they had attacked me. They have stabbed me in the back. Therefore, I, they will be disbanded and scattered after I strike their shepherd, the king. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 11, prophesies that Jerusalem and all of Israel would look on the one they have pierced and will mourn as for an only child, as for a firstborn son. This fits very well with the Babylonian exile and the purpose of it all. God wants his people to repent. And so they see as the temple is destroyed and David's house is destroyed, they mourn and they grieve. And that does actually work. They turn back to Yahweh. Well, Zechariah's words are not just a story or metaphor about the past. Turns out they are also a future prophecy. Zechariah's prophecy helps us to make sense of the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus. And that's exactly why Matthew and John put these quotes from Zechariah in there. So that we too might see the Son of God, the King of Jerusalem, the man whom the Lord loves, and Yahweh's Christ, not accepted, but rejected, pierced by a pagan spear, and dead. Mourn, John wants us to do, and grieve bitterly, exactly as Zechariah says, as for an only son, because this was an only son. The son of Jerusalem, the firstborn son of Mary, but more importantly, the son of God. It's me whom they have pierced. Zechariah and Matthew and John want us to mourn at the crucifixion of Jesus, but that's not where they want us to stop. The whole book of Zechariah is aimed towards God's people repenting and towards true devotion to Yahweh, which is the same aim as Jesus and that Matthew and John write their books towards for people to repent whom God will make his own through the death and resurrection of his killed king and son, Jesus. The shepherd of Israel is being struck, attacked by the sword of the Romans as opposed to the sword of the Babylonians in the original exile. 
and the people of God would be scattered, the disciples scattered, each going to their own place and hiding alone in fear so that God might refine them, killing yet saving in the death of Christ. In the exile, God, in the Babylonian exile, God had killed some so that others, the remnant, might be saved. The point is, see what happens to these guys, and you'll learn your lesson. You don't want to go the same way. The wicked were judged so that others might not stay wicked, but repent and return to the good God of Israel. In the exile and in so many other times in Israel's history, some were killed so that others might learn from the mistakes of those who were punished. And that when they, and upon learning, they would be saved. Yet Yahweh has grown weary of this only partially successful policy. He is desperate for his people to turn. And so this time, not some, but one is killed. It is not just a metaphor any longer that they have pierced God. It is now a reality. The one, Jesus of Nazareth, pierced and killed so that all might turn and be saved. The sheep scattered temporarily. The shepherd struck down because our good shepherd laid down his life for us. And so we too have been saved by, the, by this repentance-inspiring death and the life-giving resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.